The story takes place during Imperial Era 3050. Donatia and Curran, two countries fighting for supremacy over the world, are causing it to be torn apart due to the constant warfare and bloodshed. Amidst the strife is the island country of Nil Kamui, which has lost its independence. To make matters worse, the Red Dragon, which was supposed to be the island's guardian god, went on the rampage, killing people without mercy and destroying villages. Currently, Kakaku and Kuretsu are leading Kurin's Red Dragon expedition. Ibuki whose family was once the imperial royalty of this island is helping his friends Mashiro and Kai oversee an orphanage. Ibuki doesn't want Fugaku to train him in wielding the Rugatu sword because he believes this island doesn't need a king anymore. Fugaku wants him to at least take the sword with him. Ibuki and friends head down to the market, where they bump into Swallow craftsfully and his assistant, Merle Sherbet. Seems Swallow is here to join the Red Dragon expedition and bear their mission. The liveliness of the market is ruined when Kurin army passes by and announces to the crowd about their expedition to rid of the Red Dragon and save the people via this Dragon Eye they are transporting. The Dragon Eye starts to resonate with Ibuki in making a contract with it. Hukaku spots Ibuki with his sword and based on Kurin's rules, weapons are not allowed to be carried no matter the reason. Mashiro doesn't want Ibuki to discard the sword, but it looks like he is willing to do it. Even so, Kakaku is about to kill him when Fugaku leads his rebels to attack the Kurin army. Kuretsu gives orders to kill everybody, so the civilians also get slaughtered. Ibuki thinks Fugaku planned this rebellion, when suddenly the dragon eye gets stuck on his chest. Mashiro gets slashed when she tries to protect Kai from Kuretsu's strike. Suddenly a machine exploded, and they were able to get away using that. As expected, this becomes the catalyst for Ibuki to change. Flashback shows his royal family were killed in the last war, and that's why he thought if he became king, he would bring about war again. The red dragon bugs him to make a contract and in exchange will have his wish granted. Ibuki wants to change the world but in order to seal the contract and achieve his desire, an equivalent price must be exchanged. This means Ibuki is forced to kill Mashiro. His hand is moving on his own. Mashiro is happy to give his life to him and hopes he will be a good king. Against his will, Ibuki kills her to complete the contract as Kuretsu suddenly arrives. Then he powers up with the dragon's power to kick Kuretsu. In the aftermath, Ibuki is confronted by one of the rebel, a ha of the bounded a human joined with a beast. She confirms Mashiro is dead, and Ibuki confirms himself as this country's king. Ibuki blames Fugaku for knowing this would happen, but Kai blames Ibuki, the child of contract for killing Mashiro. When Ibuki is with Fugaku and his men discussing about the rebellion to overthrow their invaders, Swallow and Merle walk in. He is a black dragon knight from Dinesha, and was selected to be on the Red Dragon Expedition. Meanwhile in a prison in Shuka, the imprisoned Isarugi, who is the rebel leader is being accused of starting the fight between the Kurin army and Nil Kamui's rebels. His plan was to make Ibuki open his eyes and have him join the expedition which is represented by a great warrior from each country. The great sacrifice of both sides is written off as an unfortunate event, but Setsurin warns never to let this happen again. Kukaku learns about that farce, and refusing to obey orders to return as she seeks revenge and wants get back the stolen dragon eye. Swallow has no idea of Nil Kamui's situation. He thought the country is good friends with his, until Merle explains the seven-year war. That made Nil Kamui accept a treaty for a complete surrender. News of Kurin army attacking the nearby village, so the rebels get ready for some action. But instead of wasting their lives, Swallow goes to fight them all alone. Merle explains his technique that all weapons he used will break down. But at that point, the weapon unleashes its greatest potential. Ibuki realizes the orphanage is under attack by Kukaku, who is trying to lure him out. He asks Aya to ride there via riding her winged beast named Val. Aya fights to distract Kukaku, while Ibuki saves the orphans. But Aya loses and the kids are in danger. Ibuki calls for the red dragon's power, but he wants another sacrifice. Kai is willing to sacrifice his life for him, but Ibuki hesitates to kill his friend. But Kai dies to protect him from Kukaku's attack, even without Ibuki doing the killing. That was enough for the Red Dragon to accept that sacrifice. Saddened by the fact that he couldn't save him and is the same as killing him, Ibuki powers up to burn away that spider woman. In the aftermath, Ibuki agrees to join the expedition because if he stays, he will lose more of those precious to him. Besides, he wants to meet the Red Dragon. He has Fugaku take care of the orphans. Part of Kukaku sneak attacks Ibuki, but was quickly destroyed by Lu. She is Kurin's representative and she hugs Ibuki, hoping they can be friends. Swallow wants to chill with the rest, but the Nil Kamui counterparts have something else to do. I guess he'll have to do with Lu. Merle isn't pleased not because he seems like flirting with her, 
but rather he needs some money for drinks. Swallow is curious about the coffin tool Lou is carrying because of how difficult it is for him to handle one. She mentions about people not choosing the tool. Meanwhile Fugaku visits Isarugi who wants him to continue supporting Ibuki. The expedition has them leave for the journey south to the town of Haga, where they will have to find a wealthy merchant named Kaguraba, also known undead merchant for information about the Red Dragon. Merle has discovered Lu's identity as an assassin. It isn't good for the expedition but since she isn't against them, and Swallow has his own orders from Black Dragon. Ibuki treat Aya like any other human. The bounded are treated like scums by society. Because Aya sees herself as Ibuki's weapon and would die for him, this does not sit well for Ibuki because she is saying the same things like Mashiro. In that case he doesn't want to be her friend anymore. Several Kurin soldiers corner Lu and want to kill her for killing Kukaku. She opens her coffin containing a talking sword that is also her master, Kisha Tianli. It hypnotizes them to kill each other. The expedition team is at the outskirts of Haga. They receive information that Kurin and Dinesha forces are going to clash due to Haga's neutral stance and rumors of funding the rebels. This means they need a plan to get into Kaguraba's place. Lu believes she is enough to do the job. Ibuki wants to follow so she takes him. Inside his creepy mansion, the ball head machine appears before them and wants them to join him for breakfast. Kaguraba's servants, Sala Bounded, and Shadi a mixed human monster half-breed, meet Swallow and the rest and are to bring them to the merchant. I'm not sure if Kaguraba's idea of breakfast is a parade through town where all the expedition members join him. A Kurin general, Kakusho realizes Kaguraba had been fooling her by sleeping the entire month, so when he is in sight, she snipes a headshot. But Saul and Shadi repair a new head for him back at the mansion. Kaguraba explains Kakusho's anger at him for raising the price of gunpowder. A war is unavoidable at Haga. Ibuki suggests negotiation, so Kaguraba agrees to this, and if he pulls it off, he will consider him worthy of the Red Dragon information. Later, Lu whispers to Kaguraba about Ibuki's power. This is of course to make Ibuki use it and to understand the power further. Kaguraba then gives Ibuki an apology letter to be handed to Kakusho. Meanwhile Swallow and Merle meet the Dinesha counterpart, Ulrika Ledesma in hopes of buying time for Ibuki's negotiation. When Ibuki hands the letter to Kakusho, she is so mad hearing his name, she rips it without seeing. Ibuki realized that Kaguraba had expected that Kakusho would never read his letter, and that she would have to be killed in order to put an end to the war which means he must use the Red Dragon's power. His only friend around is Aya. She bugs him to kill her. Red Dragon is bugging him too. Gakusho is hesitant, because she is well aware of his power. If Aya dies, so will she. Ibuki thinks and remembers Kakusho thinks Kagaraba is dead. The path might be changed if she is told he is still alive. She is shocked to hear so, and when she reads the letter which is actually a peace treaty, she agrees to stop the war. Kaguraba agrees to let Kurin occupy Haga and cover all their expense. An offer she cannot refuse. Kaguraba is impressed Ibuki stuck to his ideals that led to this very hard outcome. He is worthy for the Red Dragon information. But he notes that Kurin won't be the only one stationed here as Dinesha will also have ambassador here. With both sides here, the power balance can be kept. After Kaguraba gathers everyone, but before he reveals the information, he wants Aya to explain her background. She was part of the Revolutionary Army's first expedition to destroy the Red Dragon. Unfortunately they got decimated when the Red Dragon went berserk. She never talked about it because she wanted to forget it. Aya explained they never got a chance when the Red Dragon attacked and thus it will not save them. Kaguraba now knows what the Red Dragon told him then. The Red Dragon expected significant change in him. He wanted Kaguraba to meet him at Agani Volcano as it will be the only place left where he can maintain his sense of reason. The discussion takes a break when Gakusho wants to go take a bath. Swallow is visited by the military's bishop, father a new male Meshwitz and is given a black dragon scale. It is believed to shift Nil Kamui's land magic ability, which are under the control of the red dragon, to the control of the black dragon. Who cares what happens to the harmony of the land of this forced switch? He believes Swallow will do a good job in furthering Dinesha's interests here. Later, when Ibuki bumps into Gakusho, she advises him never to use that power again. Or is there something he is willing to gain by losing everything? The team prepares their expedition to Algani, and they will stop by Fort Rosways which is located near it. Along the way, Kaguraba learns of Ibuki's power. He reveals the rumor that royals like him also had the power to revive those he killed. They are known as returned ones. However, they come back from the dead to assault others. Meanwhile, Gakusho and her Kurin army are receiving many villagers fleeing from Algani. They claim they have encountered the returned ones. Gakusho catches Lu in the act of robbing her tent. 
Seems Lu is interested in the gold wedge that is believed to shift this land's magic power to Kurin. Gakusho lets her keep it, but since she also knows Lu was the one who killed her comrades, she won't let her go. Keisha hypnotizes her. As Lu strikes, Gakusho is able to defend herself, seeing she placed a counter spell on it. However, Keisha tells Lu to forget about her, because her soul is so small. He wants her to go for Ulrika instead. At Rossways, Ulrika plans to go ahead and investigate further after hearing rumors of the returned ones appear. That night, Ibuki's team is assaulted by the returned ones. They seem to be Kurin soldiers. Ibuki is in shock to see Kakusho has turned into a returned one. Ulrika and her team investigate the ruins of Kakusho's unit. From the only survivor, he told how the returned ones attacked the camp and turned everyone into the same. Like how Gakusho was killed and then went on a killing spree to turn the rest into returned ones. Ibuki's team are now facing hordes of Kurin's returned ones. Thanks to Kagaraba and I figured he played enough zombie games to deduce that destroying their brains will permanently take them out. Ibuki calls upon the Red Dragon. As she considers Gakusho her friend, he is willing to kill her, so that her killer can be burnt by the flames. Because her real killer is Lu, and she is willing to take on the bet to be incinerated since Keisha could feel the returned ones having some sort of connection with the Red Dragon. Unfortunately before Ibuki could make his move, Kakusho is killed off by Heen, one of the rebels sent by Isarugi to protect Ibuki. He is definitely not amused of this especially, when Heen constantly reminds him he shouldn't be showing mercy to Kurin. Aya picks him up and tells him Heen cannot be his friend. When Ulrika returns to report her findings, they fear that those who were killed in the first expedition were the culprits in making a domino effect turning others to return ones. Ibuki still feel the need to make his way to Agani, so Ulrika informs that another Black Dragon Knight leader, Simon Taslikov is on his way to meet them at the volcano. Later, Heen talks to Ibuki and knows about his power. He wants Ibuki to kill him to kill Simon and reclaim Nil Kamui's glory. However, Ibuki is not going to do, so as he has got the wrong idea of his power. On the way to Agani Volcano, Swallow revealed to Ibuki that he knows his power. He supports Ibuki's desire to get rid of it, which is why Ibuki wants to become king and put an end to the suffering. Although Swallow thinks he should hold on to that power when he becomes king, nevertheless for now he agrees to help rid of that power. At the foot of the volcano, the returned ones rise. As they are from the first revolutionary army, Heen and his men decide to fight and put them to rest. Then there is also that bounded big rock guy, Izan. He was the leader of the first expedition, sacrificed himself to save the rest and now revived as a return one. There is a claw of the red dragon stuck in him. Heisha can sense great power and wants to be fed. Lu suggests attacking Izan from all sides, but Ibuki wants to confirm its sanity first. Swallow has decided to lay down his life for the expedition and has Merle give him the black dragon scale. He wants Ulrika to stay behind so at least she can help those kids escape since she is strong. Swallow remembers his past. He was born with this curse so naturally his parents feared him. He thought his parrot was his only friend. Then a stupid cat ate it. That is when he realized tools and lives can be broken or lost even if he doesn't touch them. That is why he joined this expedition to part ways with his absurd fate. Ibuki tries to reason with Izan, but to no avail. They make an effort to destroy the giant golem, but still has no effect. Until Swallow drops the black dragon scale into the lava, and the entire land turns black. The returned ones stop moving. Swallow further remembers a mixed was brought to him as his attendant. She was later kidnapped and on the verge of death. Swallow saved her. The black dragon was impressed and shifted her wounds onto him. Lu attacks Aizun and tries to get her master to feed on it, but was blown away by its might. Aya plans on killing Izan, and then follow him shortly. Ibuki fears she would turn into something like him. Heen then attacks Ibuki. Fearing he might have turned into a returned one, Ibuki kills him only to realize that it was just a ploy. He knew Ibuki would never use his life if he hadn't taken drastic actions of stabbing and blinding himself. However after his sacrifice, nothing happens. Swallow believes his life wasn't considered to be an equivalent exchange. I guess now it's Swallow's turn to do something. Further flashback shows his family fell from elite into bankruptcy ruin, and all the mansion's assets were confiscated under the Sherbet family. So be careful not to touch all those stuffs. Then he went to see the Black Dragon to rid of his curse. In exchange of that, the Black Dragon wants him to kill the Red Dragon, who has gone berserk with his own hands. The scar on his leg, that he saved Merle is seal of their contract. Now Swallow unleashes the power of the Black Dragon to completely kill Aizan, although he was supposed to save this move for the Red Dragon. Keisha is impressed and wonders how he would use him, but Lu feels threatened since her joy is to feed him with all the living blood that flows through her. 
The red dragon's claw now rightfully belongs to Swallow and should be a clue to what the red dragon left behind. Kagaraba then receives a message from Shadi that something is happening back at Haga. It seems Enumail is proclaiming to the people that Inori will be queen, Ibuki's younger sister. Aya remembers Mashiro once told her to help protect Ibuki because she can't do it on her own. Ibuki thought he was the only survivor from the royalty, but it looks like he thought wrong. They return to Rossways, so Lu can seek treatment after being gravely injured. The volcano has erupted, and the fort could be in danger. Simon makes his debut as he uses his awesome black dragon power to divert the lava flow. When the gang return to Haga, the siblings are happy to see each other. But even more shocking, Mashiro is alive. Fugaku as explained was the one who brought Inori here. When Fugaku visited Isarugi, he was presented with Inori whom he had hidden away from public eye because he knew Kurin would act if they found out two Imperials were living. He had to hide her till the time is right to make Inori their queen and free this island. Of course some suspicions still hang around the air because for those who witnessed Mashiro's death, they wonder if she is now a returned one. Lu shows Kagiraba the gold wedge. He agrees to work out a deal with an exchange for her to get a replacement artificial arm. Aya is still suspicious of Mashiro and Inori so she sees Kagiraba to look through his security spy cameras at what they are doing. Seems they're getting along fine. Meanwhile, Simon tells Ulrika about their orders to guard Inumail and Inori. He has the Emperor's personal cavaliers to help out with this. Aya confronts Ibuki to tell him that Mashiro is dead. Because Ibuki doesn't mind not being king anymore, she tells him even if she has been resurrected doesn't mean he can break the promise. He will be king and she will be his sword to see it through. That night, Aya calls out for Mashiro to talk. Suddenly Mashiro kisses her. However Aya isn't lesbian. More importantly, she realizes Mashiro does not have her memories and orders Val to attack. Next day she calls everyone to gather to prove that Mashiro is a returned one. Because last night she killed her. Now Aya wants Mashiro to take off her clothes. This is to prove the scars that Ibuki and Val are there. Thankfully there is security footage from Kagaraba to prove that Val indeed killed her. As being a returned one is the only logical explanation. Kagaraba can't turn a blind eye seeing such beings pose a danger to his town. That is when Inori comes in to confirm Mashiro is a returned one. She doesn't hesitate to explain because Ibuki values her deeply. She raised her from the dead. See how shocked everyone. At the end of the Seven Year War, Isarugi offered to save Inori who was trapped inside the castle. But he is the biggest culprit that brought the fall. His soldiers were ransacking the place and he wanted the dragon eye. Inori is upset at the turn of events, but Isarugi killed her along with her attendant. That is when the dragon eye began to speak to her as she made a deal with the red dragon to resurrect herself. The expedition team is currently discussing Isaruga's move, in order to allow him to support the new king, while still maintaining his revolutionary army. Inori talks to Ibuki alone after smashing all of Kagiraba's spy camera, and tells him not to trust the combined expedition as their objective is to destroy the red dragon. When they return to the rest, Inumail is not amused with all this filth, so he has a word with Inori. Swallow could feel his scar burning. He remembers talking to the black dragon after unleashing the dragon scale. Soon Nil Kamuis will drift further away from the Red Dragon and to the Black Dragon. Swallow is assured that the citizens of the land will merely lose their magic and the discrimination of Bounded and Mixed will be gone. As a reward, Swallow is given a temporal protection against any blade dubbed as Black Curtain. Ibuki is still in a dilemma to support Inori as she wants him to come with her. The plot to be Dinesh's puppet is just a ploy, as she plans to rally the rebels to kick both countries out of their land. Ibuki accidentally comes into contact with the Black Dragon. He knows his wish to have this land returned to where it was once, but from the way things are heading, there will be blood and loss of lives. The only choice is to side with Dinesha and he promises Nil Kamui's citizens will not be harmed. It is also a good deal for him since the Red Dragon will lose his power and in turn rid Ibuki of his curse. Ibuki is still in a dilemma on what to do with Mashiro, who is now taken away by a new male's attendants back to the embassy for interrogation. Despite being a returned one, she is still precious to him. While Ibuki walks around town, he feels like he doesn't want to bump into Swallow and runs away. This makes them bump into Hakui who is the new representative of Kurin and Kakusho's replacement. Ibuki makes his way to the embassy, and he sees the attendant's dead bodies. He is not happy that Inori will just revive Mashiro again if a new male kills her. Inori then suggests to kill the rest of the expedition team and starting with Lu, because Kisha can prevent reviving returned ones. Ibuki feels sad, that Inori seems to think the Red Dragon went on a rampage on her behalf. Could her madness also be under his control? At this rate she will kill everyone. Ibuki agrees to go with her, 
but wants to go see Isarugi and free him considering Dinesha won't support them anymore. When he goes to see Mashiro, looks like she just killed the fatty father. Fugaku explains that a new male was persistent in wanting Inori to rid of the filthy Mashiro. Mashiro then went berserk and killed the attendants before the father himself. Ibuki then calls for the red dragon. Looks like he is going to use Mashiro as a sacrifice. Despite being a return one, she is still precious to him. Red Dragon agrees with this exchange. Ibuki uses the flames to incinerate every bit of Mashiro's soul, so that she will never rise again. Ibuki's last words to her are he still remembers the promise to become a good king. As Ibuki, Fugaku, and Inori walk through the forest, they notice the effect of Dinesha's magic affecting the lands. They need to hurry to Shuka. When the Dinesha side goes to see Inumail, they find his dead body and of course Ibuki is missing. So the Kurin and Dinesha side discuss with Kagiraba that Isarugi is plotting something sinister by controlling the Imperials for his own purposes. As for the combined expedition, it seems there is no reason to have it since the revolutionary leader has been plotting behind their backs. Inori ambushes Aya, who has been tailing them. The bounded has been weakened, thanks to the shift in the land's power. Inori approves of the Red Dragon going berserk and killing everybody because they did nothing and allowed the invasion. She further mocks Aya's useless role and numbered days. She is so willing to die for Ibuki so that she could have the satisfaction of living and dying as his sword and friend. Because Ibuki only sees her as an attendant, her life is of no value and will die meaningless like him. This affects Aya and she seeks Ibuki's confirmation. He has to bite his tongue and say her he doesn't consider her as his blade and wants her to return to Kagiraba. This is the only way he can protect her. Swallow and Lu meet and they realize the expedition was just a ploy to buy time for all the political posturing behind the scenes. They still want to go ahead with their mission, but it seems both have a different mission in mind. Swallow wants to save Ibuki, while Lu wants to find the Red Dragon. Hisha is interested in staying with Swallow because he will get to feed on other Black Dragon Knights. This makes Lu jealous as she vows to be the one to kill the Red Dragon. Later, Hakui sees Lu and talks about the rumors, how she got that sword although she dismisses them as just rumors. He has orders from Setsurin that she is to take the Red Dragon's life, even if she has only one life left. Swallow and Merle prepare to leave for Shuka. Ulrika offers to help out, and she warns Lu is an evil person. Ulrika loads the Red Dragon's claw onto her ship. Lu ambushes her as she wants the claw. Ulrika unleashes her Black Dragon power, and summons some sort of Hydra from the depths of the shadows to counterattack. When both sides clash, naturally Ulrika is tempted by Keisha. But when Lu lands the killing blow, she couldn't kill Ulrika outright because her holy spirit is protecting her. Ulrika is pulled out of hypnosis by the pain when she captures Lu. But Lu mocks Ulrika's ideal, saying that she will never even get to touch Swallow. Then she drops her gold wedges to shift the power to her side. After finishing off the Hydra and Ulrika's holy spirit is destroyed, Lu kills her. However they realize they have been had because Ulrika was the decoy. The box supposedly containing the claw is empty. The corpses from Ulrika's tragic mission are found. Simon can only guess Ulrika's body because her head is missing. With Kurin and Dinesha side on the verge of killing each other, Kagaraba intervenes and then disbands the expedition. Knowing Ulrika's intention for the expedition for all sides to join hands and save the Red Dragon, Kagaraba vows to carry out her will. Swallow and Merle seem to be traveling with Setsurin. She hints to Swallow she knows what he is looking for and can give it to him. Before they get suspicious of her, she leaps off the carriage. Lu finds a weakened and dying Aya, and the latter is still stubborn to make Ibuki the king. Lu gives her a gold wedge that would neutralize the pain in her body, but she will only have a few more days to live. At Shuga's capital, the provisional governor, Kurama Kazusa has decided to execute Isarugi without trial, since they discover his plot to place Inori as the false queen. Setsurin is also here and she wants Swallow to not harm the Red Dragon. As he is in contract with the Black Dragon, killing the Red Dragon means the Black Dragon will absorb that power. It will be a problem for her. In exchange for that, she can lift his curse. She tries to get Merle to persuade him, but maybe she went too far by suggesting she could touch him all she wants. Merle slaps her. Swallow seems not to mind his curse now because he realizes with everything that breaks, something new is born. He threatens to even test this on her. Ibuki goes into the prison alone to speak with Isarugi. To his surprise, Isarugi is supporting him to be king. Is he playing double agent? Furthermore, he wants Ibuki to kill Inori. Inori knows she has been set up by Isarugi when the Dinesha Cavaliers and Revolutionary Army team up against her. Isarugi reveals that it wasn't Inori who went mad because of the Red Dragon. Because of her, the Red Dragon went berserk. When she was hiding in a village, the villagers realize who she is and killed her in fear of Kurin's retaliation. 
but that only made it worse. The red dragon appeared from inside her mouth and burnt down everything. And right now it seems the red dragon is doing the same. How the heck does that big red thing hide in this little girl? He's burning down the entire prison too. Inori now remembers that Isarugi was the one who killed her parents. Isarugi doesn't even hesitate to admit that. Because the king was planning to give false security to Nil Kamui by offering the land to Kurin and Dinesha, he could not accept this and killed him. Isarugi tells Ibuki to kill her, and he will be known as the king who defeated the red dragon. The slabs fall on Isarugi. I guess execution came early. Fugaku saves Ibuki from a similar fate. He wants him to use his life to stop Inori. However, Ibuki cannot hear the red dragon's voice. Inori kills off Fugaku. When Lu and Swallow meet, she seems to want to face off with him, despite knowing their powers cancel out each other. Knowing that Swallow has not learned of Ulrika's death yet, Lu uses it as a trump card to surprise him by throwing her head at him. However, he coolly dodges it and continues fighting as normal. Swallow is so used to see precious things destroyed, so there is no time for him to look back at things that are already broken. The Red Dragon takes the fight to the capital. Simon shows his double contract by summoning the Black Dragon to cut down the Red Dragon. Ibuki is undecided whether to kill Inori. Aya flies into the scene to stab Inori, so that Ibuki doesn't have to get his hands dirty. Ibuki reminds Aya she is not her sword, but in fact his most precious friend. However, Inori and the Red Dragon revive and continue their attack, thanks to their contract to each other. The Red Dragon lives as long as Inori lives, and since no attack can reach Inori due to the divine protection of the Red Dragon, it's like they are an immortal pair. Aya seems determined to sacrifice her life as she sings her song to attack Inori. She wants Ibuki to use her life. Ibuki has now decided. Aya lost the battle to Inuri. Shadi brings Swallow the Dragon's Claw. But Swallow mentions about the Red Dragon's immortality so defeating him with this is also meaningless. Therefore the Dragon Claw might just be a key to restoring the Red Dragon's sanity. Then the person who should wield this should be one related to the Red Dragon, not Swallow himself. Lu starts using her gold wedges and attack the dragon and Keisha is totally loving the taste of life. Swallow and Merle go to see Hakui to request his help to use Kurin's ultimate floating vessel, Killin Chuin. Although Setsurin's orders were specifically for Kurin's escape, he can't let innocent people die and agrees to let them use it. As Ibuki searches for Aya, the red dragon contacts him. The red dragon mentions about his consciousness is about to be swallowed by Inori's anger. Her flames of wrath are burning stronger. From Killin Chuin, Swallow tosses the claw to Ibuki. Ibuki then finds Aya amidst the rubble, and vows not to make her become a victim of this. Inori plans to kill Ibuki, and revive him as a returned one. That way, he will be the same kind brother she always knew. Kagurava's sturdy body protects Ibuki from the red dragon's flames. As Hakui is having a hard time controlling Killin Chuin, Swallow takes over. Hakui is not happy he is going to destroy something that his clan created for 100 years. Somehow the sight of Swallow just pisses off Lu. Instead of letting Keisha feed on the Red Dragon, she rather go fight with him. The duo fight until Killin Chuin crashes into the Red Dragon. Lu is going to kill Merle. Swallow uses his black curtain to save her, and takes the hit. Despite the Red Dragon gone from the kamikaze crash, Inori can still summon him. It just felt comical that Aya and Val charge and bump her away. She still wants to become his sword till the very end. Realizing how weak Aya is, Ibuki allows himself to be devoured by the red dragon. Because of the claw in hand, it returns the red dragon to his sanity. He couldn't be more grateful. But of course, Ibuki must still offer an equivalent exchange, although he has decided to live with this curse and want to end this horrible cycle of event. Ibuki will offer him his most precious thing, but wants him to promise something in return. When Inori tries to summon the red dragon, he ignores her. Now we have Ibuki eyes opened. He realized everyone had sacrificed their precious things to move forward while he tried not to lose them. This only meant he could continue to live while taking something precious from someone else. Now he knows which friend to kill and protect. Kagurava offers himself, but Ibuki chooses Aya. After he kills her, the red dragon's flames burn Inori to a crisp. Swallow still lives. He sees the black dragon who is satisfied with his good work. However Swallow has changed his mind about his curse. He has accepted it as part of his life. Swallow regains consciousness, and Merle couldn't be happier to see him. As Lu searches among the rubbles, she finds Inori's dragon eye. It now becomes attached to her chest. A month later, Kurin and Dinesha has sat down and work out some roadmap. They have officially approved of the new king, who is no other than Ibuki. But the coronation has to be delayed since Ibuki isn't around. He is running through some desert heading to a place where Aya will be reborn. The promise made was when Ibuki offered Aya's life. He wants the remains of Val's life to be placed into her. 
although this means a new Aya will be born with a new soul, memory and mind. Ibuki doesn't care if Aya is different or does not remember him as long as he lives. Now she is reborn as the last dragon shrine maiden, but somehow her body feels like she needs to go see someone and travel with him again. Thank you for watching till the end, and please don't forget to subscribe.